Hey there, Donovan. I hope this finds you well. I've been meaning to write to you for some time, but it's taken me a while to put my thoughts together. What I have experienced is something that most people would consider crazy or unbelievable. My name is Tim, and I live in Southeast Alaska. A couple of years ago, during the summer months, myself and three friends went on a four-day hiking trip into the back country of Denali National Park. The first two days were pretty uneventful. We hiked about 10 miles from the trailhead to our camping spot near one of the lakes within the park boundary. On day three, we decided to take a different route up onto one of the mountains so we could get an aerial view of where we were. There are several mountains surrounding these particular lakes. It was around midday when we made it up onto this mountain ridge, probably close to 3,000 feet above sea level. We had stopped at a nice vantage point that overlooked the lakes. We spent maybe half an hour taking pictures and eating lunch before my friend Jim noticed something moving strangely along one side of another mountain directly across from us. He pulled out his binoculars and started watching whatever it was closely. I took out my own pair and focused them on what he had already been looking at for about five minutes by then. As soon as I saw it through my binoculars, my mind went haywire, not only because I couldn't figure out what kind of animal or creature it might be, but also due to the sheer size alone. This thing stood over eight feet tall. Its arms hung down below its knees like I've seen apes do when they walk on their knuckles. It wasn't covered with hair though, like most descriptions given by eyewitnesses of similar creatures. But it did have a large cone-shaped head with pointed ears and huge dark red eyes that were scanning its surroundings as if looking for something. I quickly looked away from the binoculars and glanced over at Jim who was still watching this creature with a crazy look on his face. He didn't say anything to me, but I could see in his face that he too was shocked by what we were seeing. As I continued to watch this thing, it began moving along the mountainside, not walking on two legs like you would expect of a two-legged creature. Instead, it used its arms as well for balance. It really did look more ape-like than human. At one point, while traversing down towards another ridge, this creature stopped and appeared to be scanning towards us. We all dove behind some rocks just in case. After about five minutes or so, it resumed moving across the mountainside until eventually disappearing into some thick brush. Silence hung heavy for several moments before any of us spoke. When we finally did begin talking again, there seemed to be an underlying sense of fear in each of our voices. We all knew deep down that whatever it was we had just seen wasn't normal. None of us believed in Bigfoot prior to this experience, but after witnessing what we had seen through those binoculars up on that mountain ridge, well, let's just say none of us are skeptics anymore. The hike back out was very tense. We constantly looked around, thinking something might jump out from behind a tree or bush at any moment. When nightfall came, though, my friends and I sat around our campfire taking small sips of whiskey, which helped calm our nerves somewhat. Later on, though, when we went off into separate tents, things got weird for me personally. I woke up sometime during the early morning hours feeling like someone or something was watching me. My tent door faced uphill, so I unzipped it quietly and peered outside without making much noise. It took only seconds for my eyes to adjust enough to see that there was indeed something moving around our campsite. I don't know how many of these things were out there, but I could clearly make out at least two different shapes. One appeared larger than the other, and both seemed to be crouched down near where we had made a fire earlier. My heart raced as I watched them from inside my tent. They would occasionally stand up on their hind legs before dropping back down onto all fours again. They stayed within close proximity of each other, though, almost like they were communicating with one another through some sort of guttural, grunting noise. As far as what happened next goes, well, it's difficult for me to describe accurately due to the extreme fear I felt during this particular moment in time. Suffice it to say, when these creatures finally left our campsite, just before sunrise, they didn't simply walk away into the woods like normal animals might do. Instead, they seemed to disappear by dematerializing right before my very eyes. They literally vanished into thin air, leaving no trace behind whatsoever. The only thing that remained was an eerie feeling that lingered throughout the rest of the day. I told the others and we looked around but didn't find evidence, so I'm not sure if they thought I dreamt it 
or if it really happened. We broke camp shortly after sunrise and hiked straight back to the trailhead without stopping once along the way. It's been over a year now since this incident occurred. None of us have spoken about it until recently, when Jim told his brother, who lives here in town near us. He thought maybe he should share the story with someone else besides just us four guys. And here's the kicker. After hearing about everything that took place with us, his response surprised me because he too had seen something similar in Denali. Except instead of a Bigfoot-looking creature, his sighting involves small gray aliens. I mean, what are the chances of that? Now personally, I don't believe aliens exist or ever visit Earth, so I can't relate much to Jim's experience. And yet, here I am, trying to hope he believes my crazy story. In general, I feel unease whenever I am alone outdoors anymore, especially in wilderness areas, like national parks, etc. But having said that, all those experiences definitely change perceptions regarding the possibility of unknown beings living amongst all of us. Well, I guess that's more or less everything I wanted to tell you. Thank you for taking time to read this. I am writing to you because I need someone to believe me. To be honest, this event is the reason why I do not go out into the wilderness alone anymore and prefer to stay in my apartment as much as possible. I was a young woman when it happened in 2012 and was about 25 years old. It took place during my second year of studying abroad at an American university in Seattle, Washington. I'm from England, by the way. I had decided since Alaska was so close and considering its reputation for being a vast wild land, that I would travel there over my summer break. After researching different national parks in Alaska online, I eventually settled on one located within Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve, which happens to be America's largest national park. Go ahead and look it up. It's literally larger than Yellowstone National Park, Yosemite National Park, and the country of Switzerland all combined. My reasoning for choosing this particular location was largely due to how isolated it appeared to be on maps, with very few roads or signs of human civilization. The plan was simple. Fly from Seattle to Anchorage, rent a car, drive east the 300 or so miles that would lead directly into McCarthy, a small town outside the boundaries of the park where there were supposedly some hostels available for visitors. During the six-hour drive, I couldn't help but think how remote everything felt, compared with other places in the lower 48 states, such as Wyoming or Montana, both places that have their own unique charm, but still feel relatively populated by comparison. One thing worth mentioning, though, is that once you get past Palmer, a small city northeast of Anchorage, things start becoming more desolate pretty quickly, especially after crossing the Matanuska River near Sutton. In any case, after spending a very long day driving through mountains, past rivers teeming with salmon, and seeing moose grazing near streams along the side of the highway, a not uncommon sight around these parts, I finally arrived at McCarthy late afternoon under cloudy skies. The town itself consisted mainly of a handful of buildings. There were only a few cars parked in front of buildings that appeared to not be open at the time. A few people could be seen walking around or sitting on benches near the post office, but otherwise it was a quiet town with not much going on. As mentioned earlier, I had done some research before coming here and knew that there were a couple of places to stay in McCarthy, so I headed towards one of them, which turned out to be quite a nice place despite its rustic appearance. It took about 20 minutes from where I parked my car down a gravel path behind trees until I reached the entrance to the main building. Due to being later in the day, I didn't expect to see anyone working in the reception area, but I noticed light shining through the window when I approached the door, so I decided to give it a try anyway. Upon entering the hotel lobby, I saw a young woman standing behind the counter. She introduced herself as Amy and explained she was the manager while the owners were away for the summer season visiting family in the lower 48 states. Amy also told me about nearby trails leading into the park if you wanted to go hiking and explore the surrounding wilderness more closely, something I was definitely interested in doing, along with a map showing all these different routes available to visitors. 
Following dinner at a local restaurant across the street from the hotel, I went back to my room to get some rest since I had planned to start early the following morning, catch a sunrise over the mountains, and hopefully spot wildlife wandering in their natural habitats. Before continuing to describe events that occurred the next day, I need to explain something else. During previous trips to other national parks such as Yellowstone, I experienced many encounters with bears, wolves, foxes, etc., and have always been able to avoid confrontations successfully using common sense and caution whenever necessary. I'm saying this because I want you to know that I wasn't completely naive to nature, thinking I wouldn't run into any problems. I'm also aware that Alaska has a higher concentration of large predators compared to the rest of the U.S. due to the vast amount of undeveloped land, combined with abundant food sources available to these animals throughout the year, particularly salmon. But none of this deterred me from coming here wanting to see these creatures firsthand, so I made sure to carry bear spray at all times, just in case I needed to use it to protect myself, in case a close encounter occurred. And now, finally, the moment you've been waiting to hear. The actual sighting happened early in the morning, while hiking one of the trails mentioned earlier. I can't remember which specific trail I took since there were several to choose from, but I think it was either Root Glacier or Kennecott Mine Trail, both leading into different parts of the park. As I approached the fork in the road, deciding whether to continue towards the glacier or explore the old mining area, I heard this intense rustling noise behind trees right next to where I was standing. I turned and looked, expecting to see a moose or deer or something similar suddenly emerge into the clearing in front of me, except it wasn't anything like that at all. What I saw defied description and words, and even now, I struggle to find a proper way to describe what I witnessed without sounding completely insane. In the simplest terms possible, imagine a giant hairy creature walking on two legs, resembling an ape, yet with a more human-like appearance. Its long, muscular arms covered in dark brown fur, hanging almost down to touching the ground, as it moved through the underbrush nearby. It took me a split second to realize this was not good at all. I didn't know what to do at first. I froze, watching closely while also making sure to keep my distance in order to avoid provoking any aggressive behavior if the thing decided to attack suddenly. However, after a few seconds, I realized it probably hadn't noticed my presence yet since it appeared focused on something else going on further ahead. This gave me the chance to take a couple photos using a telephoto lens attached to the camera, which I fortunately brought along on the trip. And then slowly, I reached into my backpack to retrieve the bear spray in case any action needed to be taken quickly. By the time I managed to turn back toward the creature, however, it had already disappeared around the bend in the path and vanished. Whether it went off in another direction or simply crouched down to hide somewhere, I couldn't tell but knew it was still somewhere nearby, and to me it seemed like it was waiting for an ambush. I also felt strange, like this feeling of uneasiness wondering what might happen next. After all, who wouldn't be afraid of such an encounter, especially considering the possible outcome that could be bestowed upon me by this creature if things went wrong somehow? Stupidly, I decided to continue cautiously, hoping I could get closer without alerting it to my presence again. Why I thought I could be smarter than a wild creature, no one knows. But this time, I kept an eye on my surroundings with each step I took, in case something unexpected happened. It didn't take long before I noticed a clearing up ahead, where it had stopped, and seemed to be drinking from a small stream flowing down towards the valley below. I adjusted my settings on the camera and held up the zoom lens for a better focus on the target while maintaining a safe distance between us. Then, taking another look through the viewfinder, I suddenly realized there were two of these creatures standing together, instead of just one. The second stood slightly behind the first, partly obscured by some vegetation, making it difficult to determine its exact size proportions clearly. However, I estimated them both to be at least eight feet tall based upon comparison with the surrounding trees and bushes. They also appeared quite heavy, with broad shoulders, muscular arms and chests, indicating enormous strength within their bodies. Meanwhile, 
I continued observing their activities, noticing how gently they handled each other's movements, unlike anything ever seen before in real life. It was similar to how I've seen animals behaving toward the others around them in nature documentaries. It almost seemed like they cared deeply about each other's well-being, despite the fact that they were wild beings supposedly devoid of any human emotions whatsoever. As mentioned earlier, I managed to take several pictures documenting the entire event using a telephoto lens attached to my camera equipment, although the light conditions weren't ideal due to the overcast skies. I still believe I captured some very compelling evidence supporting the existence of these creatures, contrary to skeptics' claims suggesting otherwise. Then suddenly, I heard a loud noise coming from the left. I immediately and instinctively turned in the direction of this noise, expecting to see someone else approaching. Suddenly, much to my surprise, I found another individual of similar appearance emerging from the woods right in front of me. Only it was a much smaller being, roughly half height to the original pair. This third resembled a juvenile, perhaps the offspring of the adults, presumably learning the survival skills necessary to thrive in an environment like the one in which we were in, currently. Curious, I checked the telephoto viewfinder to see if I could make out any facial features despite the distance between us, about 50 yards. Unfortunately, I didn't manage to get a clear shot of its face due to obstructing foliage, but I clearly noticed how it seemed to mimic the movements of its parents perfectly while imitating their gestures and actions. These were indeed genuine creatures living and breathing in a reality that existed right in front of my eyes at that very moment. Was this all a dream? Was I hallucinating? I couldn't believe I was witnessing this in real time. Yet everything felt really authentic unlike anything I had ever experienced before in life, regardless of whether it was fiction or fact. However, I was neither stupid nor wanted to become another statistic, so I decided to leave the area immediately, heading back to the hotel as quickly as possible, making sure that I never lost sight of the trail behind me. I didn't want to be attacked by a creature who had decided to follow my footsteps. I was lucky enough to escape unharmed, eventually reaching the safety of the town. I immediately told Amy the manager and was hoping she'd believe the story since she'd probably heard similar tales before. Unfortunately, the response wasn't what was expected. Instead, I was told to stop spreading rumors and scaring away potential customers to the hotels nearby and towns surrounding the region. Surprised and disappointed with her reaction, I decided to keep silent unless someone else happened to encounter the same thing in the future. Perhaps someone else could even provide proof. Hopefully others like us exist out there somewhere. As a conclusion, I wish to express gratitude to you for sharing stories and providing a platform where we can share experiences with others who might be interested in hearing what happened. My experience in Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve in Alaska in the summer of 2012 will hopefully inspire someone else to come forward with evidence. And personally, I want this to be revealed so that someone takes a stand and speaks on behalf of raising awareness to the issues related to preservation, conservation, wildlife, and the environment in general. Ever since we got married, my wife and I made a promise to each other to keep the spirit of adventure alive in our relationship no matter how mundane life got. We're both high school teachers, and we often find ourselves craving peace and quiet. Sundays became the day we would take our little escapades from the world, a tradition where we'd pick a random spot on the map within driving distance and just go. It was our way of keeping things fresh, exploring the unexplored, or sometimes just finding a new place to enjoy a quiet moment together. This particular Sunday was no different, or so we thought, as we pulled some food and drink together, eager to escape the city. This week, we decided to head to Yosemite National Park in California. We are lucky that it is only a few hours' drive from our house. And let me tell you that driving to the park felt like shedding layers of the weekly grind with every mile we put behind us. Even the drive there is inspiring and makes you realize how small your problems are when you find yourself in the enormity of nature. The park itself, 
known for its sprawling landscapes and tranquil settings, seemed like the perfect getaway. It was about 1 p.m. when we arrived. To our dismay, though, it looked like the world had the same idea this weekend, and the place was buzzing with people. After circling around, we found our little oasis, a secluded spot near the woods, shielded by large rocks, away from the crowds. We headed out along a trail, both carrying backpacks with our food and drinks, and hiked for about 45 minutes before deciding to stop at an area we found with a flat rock that overlooked more of the park. We stopped there and sat down to take a break. While we were reveling in the peace, my eyes caught something peculiar in the sky. White spheres or orbs danced above the tree line, moving in a manner that didn't resemble anything typical of nature or man-made flying objects. I nudged my wife, pointing them out. She glanced at them with mild interest before returning to her meal. It was odd but not alarming, especially since they weren't super noticeable in the light of the day. It wasn't until the silence was shattered by two deafening booms, sending a wave of unease through us that she decided she should pay attention. Curiosity got the better of me, and I stood up and looked in the direction of what I thought was the sound's origin, only to see and find nothing. I decided to walk a bit down a path, and my wife followed me, not wanting to be alone. The park's vastness and isolation suddenly felt more eerie than peaceful. We both had the instant feeling of how dangerous it can be to be out on your own with no one else around. Returning to our spot, the world around us seemed to have paused. It was in this total silence that real fear crept in. My wife was visibly shaking as she clutched my arm. She felt it too. There was a real and negative vibe to that part of the park. Then, out of nowhere, three creatures covered in long brown hair appeared off in the distance. Their presence was as out of place as the silence that enveloped us. They moved with an unsettling purpose, not acknowledging anything around them. Their looks screamed power and control, but it was the way they walked that scared us the most. They looked like they knew exactly where they were going, and they were going there with a purpose. We watched, holding our breath, as they disappeared over the hill. And just like that, the world came back to life. The sound of nature and humanity returned, as if someone had indeed flipped a switch. My wife and I looked at each other in absolute shock and disbelief. Had we just seen what we thought we did? Three creatures from horror films just walking past us like it was nothing. We packed up soon after, the day's strange adventure leaving a sour taste. What started as a routine escape turned into a story that neither of us could explain. My wife, usually the more adventurous one, has since been apprehensive about our Sunday explorations, insisting we not talk about what happened. But how can I not? The questions with no answers, the creatures, the orbs, and the silence. It's all too strange to simply forget. Now that we've shared the experience with some of our friends and family, some say we stumbled upon a government experiment. Others suggest something more extraterrestrial. But in actuality, the truth remains elusive. So, to anyone out there listening to this tale, I ask, what do you think we saw that day? Have you ever encountered something so out of the ordinary that it defies explanation? And how about two strange phenomena in one day? In sharing this story, I hope to find answers or at least others who've witnessed the inexplicable. Perhaps in the end, I'll figure it all out, but I don't have high hopes for that. But that won't stop me from seeking the truth. Thank you for listening. Before all of this went down, and I stumbled into the heart of this crazy mystery that would leave me questioning everything I thought I knew, I was just a regular person with a passion for photography. Now, not so much. But my project, which started as a simple exploration of the landscapes around my hometown in Indiana, brought me to a place that locals simply called the Old Fields. Located on the outskirts of a small, nondescript town in the heart of the Midwest, this area of land was known for its untouched acreage, sprawling fields, forests, and the occasional lone tree standing in the middle of a grassy field. It was the perfect place to try and get the pictures I had in my mind. And my pictures, I mean drone pictures. 
I was trying to hone my skills with drone photography. The old fields had always been a part of local lore, with stories passed down through generations about its weird and mysterious happenings. It was said that the light there, especially at dawn and dusk, could make the land seem like it had moved into a different dimension. Everyone knew it. Everyone said it. But I don't really think anyone actually believed it. I had visited these fields many times before, with my regular camera trying to capture that elusive light. That feeling of stepping through to another world that wasn't quite the same. But nothing I had experienced in my previous visits could have prepared me for what I was about to encounter on this day. I decided to head out during the height of the day and capture the light that people thought could sometimes turn strange. When I got there, the sun was bright as could be, casting long shadows and turning the fields into that hue that makes you need to put your sunglasses on. It was in this light that I sent my drone off to try and get some interesting angles. Little did I know that my drone's camera would capture something that defied explanation. The old fields, a place I thought I knew like the back of my hand, revealed a shocking secret that day. So, there I was, standing in the middle of this vast, open field, drone controller in hand, eyes glued to the small screen that showed me what the drone's camera saw from above. It was a pretty standard day for what I had planned, get some aerial shots for my photography project. The sun was high, the sky was clear, and there was just enough breeze to keep the midday heat at bay, but not so much to mess with my drone flying. Everything was going as expected, until all hell broke loose. I maneuvered the drone over different parts of the field, taking shots here and there, focusing on the patterns made by the wind in the tall grass. The odd tree standing alone, casting a long shadow. It was peaceful, almost meditative. I was so caught up in the routine of it all, the back and forth, the slight adjustments to get the perfect shot, that when I first saw it, I couldn't really process what it was. On the screen, amid the normal old greens and browns of the field, there was a flash of something different. It moved with such speed and grace, it barely seemed real. This wasn't just any animal. It was something almost shiny in the bright sun. It ran on all fours, sure, but the way it moved was almost liquid, like it was part of the wind, and its coat or skin or whatever, it shimmered. Not like wet fur and sunlight, but like it was made of something other than fur. Something smooth. It reflected the light in a way that seemed impossible. I remember blinking, shaking my head, thinking the sun was screwing around with my eyes, or the screen was glitching. But the thing kept moving, and I, almost on autopilot, followed it with the drone, my fingers moving the controls with a mind of their own. I zoomed in, trying to get a better look, trying to understand what I was seeing. The creature, hearing the drone's presence, stopped. It looked up, directly at the camera, and that's when I felt a chill run down my spine. There was a kind of awareness that you don't see in wild animals. It was like it knew it was being watched, and understood what the drone was. For a moment, we were locked in this silent standoff. Me staring at the screen, it staring at the drone, and then, it turned and sprinted off toward the forest that bordered the field. I tried to follow to see where it went, but it was like it vanished into thin air the moment it reached the trees. Plus, I couldn't get the drone in there to follow it. I stood there thinking about what I'd just seen. My mind raced through every logical explanation, trying to find one that fit, but nothing did. It wasn't a known animal, that was for sure. It wasn't anything that made sense. Eventually, I flew the drone back to me and packed up my gear, the footage still burning in the back of my mind. When I got home, I watched it over and over, pausing, zooming, trying to catch some detail that would give me an answer. But if anything, it only deepened the mystery. The creature was a complete mystery. Its coat, its movements, its awareness of the drone, it was all unexplainable. I thought about sharing the footage, about trying to find out if anyone else had seen anything like it. But part of me hesitated. The world is full of unexplained mysteries, and once something becomes known, it loses a bit of its magic, and I don't want to be the one to reveal the truth about the old fields. I wanted that mystery to stay a mystery, and besides, 
I wasn't sure I wanted the answers to the questions I had. Some things are more interesting left unanswered. I like when I have moments of wonder that remind me there's still so much we don't understand. So, the footage remains with me, locked up in my safe. My personal encounter with the unexplainable. Every now and then, I play it back, and each time, I'm filled with that same sense of awe and confusion. That same chill runs down my spine. But I'm still not ready to share it yet. But maybe, one day I will. If so, I'll let you know. April 2017. I was spending the week with my mom and my new stepdad up in northern Michigan. It was 2017, and I was halfway through high school. Classes were still in session, but on account of my mom's new marriage, my brother and I were allowed to spend some extra family time together outside of school. My mom seemed to feel a vacation would somehow bring us all closer. So we rented a cabin. It was all right, I guess. It was a quaint little place with a bit of a kitschy country feel, not like the city where I was used to living. I thought my new stepdad was a little weird. He liked to tell stories about werewolves and other creepy cryptid creatures. He believed they were all somehow related. In my opinion, the creatures were one and the same, but that was only based on what had I heard, not actual facts. My stepdad was convinced he'd actually seen one of the creatures when he was a boy. I guess that's what started his whole infatuation with the idea. I personally have never been one to blindly believe anything anyone told me. I needed proof. The dog man, for example, was a highly unlikely being. A creature with a man's body and the head of a dog. I had a strong interest in biology, and the whole thing just didn't add up genetically. On that fateful day when everything changed, I had just entered the dining room. My brother was just about to take a bite out of his sandwich. He could see the look on my and my stepdad's faces, and his eyes shifted from our stepdad and then to me. We both were staring over my brother's shoulder and out the window behind him. My stepdad and I exchanged astonished glances. We just couldn't believe what was happening. There, in the backyard, was a man hunkered over with his head in our charcoal grill. It was odd behavior to say the least. My stepdad had made us all steak and a salad for lunch but the surface of the grill had been cooled to the touch for some time, so why anyone would want to sniff the bricks of coal was beyond me. I think my brother thought we were staring at him. He lowered his sandwich down toward his plate as if being silently judged. My stepdad and I, of course, weren't judging anyone. We continued to watch in horror as the man lifted his shaggy mane and sniffed around. It was then we realized this was no ordinary man. In fact, it wasn't a man at all. The shirtless human male torso appeared to be chestnut brown in color. Yet the head was what captivated us the most. Long strands of hair, wispy and thick like a Pomeranian, painted on in thick coats of jet black, coppery red, and a shock of white, stretched out on both sides of its face. Oh, but the eyes. The eyes were what kept us mesmerized. They were both a piercing amber color. I had never seen anything so strange and so beautiful in my entire life. The creature straightened his stance. He knew he'd been seen and that we were watching him. I tugged on my stepdad's shirt sleeve. We sprinted from the dining room through the kitchen toward the back door and towards the patio area. We both charged for the door. My stepdad beat me there, but I wasn't upset. All I could think about was getting a better look at the creature outside. Once my stepdad and I stumbled our way out into the open, the impossibly tall dog-like man began to back up while still staring at both of us. I reached out my hand, unsure if the creature would act like a dog or a man. To my utter amazement, the creature howled. At least, I think it was a howl. It kind of sounded like a human screaming. Its teeth were long and curved, like miniature spikes, only much thinner. They were still bigger in size than a large breed canine's teeth. None of them were jagged like in the urban legends I'd heard in the past. My blood began to curdle and I started to seriously wonder why we had come outside. Both of my palms started to sweat and my heart raced like crazy inside my chest. Fight or flight had kicked in and I wished desperately it would all go away. But I couldn't. I had forgotten how to move. My stepdad hadn't though. He had slipped his cell phone deftly out of his back pants pocket 
and was lifting it to capture a few seconds of live footage. Upon seeing the phone, the creature spun around quickly. Now I could see that its lower torso appeared to be that of a canine. It was strange to watch it run off on two feet, and I actually doubted that I was really seeing what I was seeing. In my opinion, I don't think canines were ever meant to run as bipeds. It gives them a strange kind of gait, or at least this one was strange. It almost bounced as I watched it bob up and down in a blur of speed. I stared after it for a long time, eventually staring at the spot where it ran off into the trees. My stepdad looked almost giddy with a huge grin on his face. I had never seen him smile so big in all the time I'd known him. I was astonished that he wasn't afraid at all, and I was hoping he had gotten some footage, but when I peeked over to watch his video, the image was distorted. My stepdad frowned and scratched his head. His spirits had now clearly plummeted. I kind of felt bad for him. He'd waited so long to prove the existence of these wild creatures, and now it had shown up and he had no proof, other than the fact that my brother and I had both seen it. In some strange way, witnessing the dogman so close and in person had brought me and my stepdad a little closer than we once were. I guess we now had more in common since I know believed, just like him. We headed back inside the house, not in defeat, but as a newly formed team in search of the truth. I know it exists. He knows it exists. And now you know it too. That is, as long as you believe what I'm saying. My suggestion is to never stop believing in these creatures. I know I won't. Some things can't be rationalized or explained. I understand that. I know when some things are more make-believe than factual, but I have to admit, I found myself in one heck of a dilemma that summer night. I'm not one for ghost stories. My grandparents sure liked telling them when I was growing up, but they weren't for me. I liked reality, even as a kid. So that's what makes this encounter so difficult for me to express, because I cannot explain with certainty what all had happened. Being part of law enforcement, we are taught to think with logic and factually accurate information. And even though our town was a bit into folklore and all of that, we knew what was real and what wasn't. That's how it was to me then, black and white, fact and fiction. I've mentioned I've heard stories about spooky things. So I was familiar with some of the crazy things people dreamed up, but I never gave them much weight. Anyhow, I was working one day, it was hot. It was the middle of summer. This particular day, we had been called to help a lady. She said that some delinquents were harassing her and her kids. She said they'd been doing some awful things like throwing rocks at her kids in their house. One had even taken out one of her windows. The woman was furious, as one might imagine. She said that her kids had been playing in the backyard and that they had seen someone in the trees. She said that they were throwing rocks at her kids. So her kids do what kids do. Monkey see, monkey do. You know the saying, and her kids start throwing rocks. They think it's some fun game that they got going on, but one of the kids gets a rock to the head. The woman thought her kid had a concussion, but they didn't. They were fine, but the problem was that they continued to do it, and someone else was teaching them to do it. This was many decades ago, so teaching your kids right from wrong was very straight and narrow. If I had that woman for a mother, I would have been scared to get the belt, you know what I mean? But the woman said she was wanting to get to the bottom of the behavior and hold the juveniles accountable for teaching her kids such awful behavior. I agreed with the woman. Something needed to be done. So we went to the woman's home. Sure enough, one of her windows was busted out, and one of the kids was still walking around with a bandage wrapped all the way around their head. It was a bit unusual. The situation. Sometimes I still think about it. Something just seemed off right off the bat. But what we discovered was much darker than some teenagers being knuckleheads. We interviewed the children and the mother. The mother just kept talking about how those kids needed to be punished. And where were their parents? Sometimes, when someone is so worked up like that, the best thing to do is nod your head. Because nobody, I mean nobody, is going to change their mind. That's how my mother was too. And my sister, all of us in our family really. When we have our minds made up, good luck. So then we start talking to the children. 
The oldest one stated that they were outside playing tag and that someone had been throwing rocks. So they started throwing rocks back. They said it was to teach the other person a lesson at first, but that it eventually turned into a fun game. The middle child, the one with the bandage, had said that they'd been playing this game for a couple of weeks now. They hadn't seen the kid who was playing with them, but that they were starting to make good friends. The youngest, they had the most information. They said that the kid in the woods was more like a man and that they could see their eyes in the trees, that they smelt awfully bad. But they then said, Mama says we can't make fun of people for that. So we made friends. At this point, I'm starting to fear that the children are interacting with a town squatter, but I don't tell the mother anything. I didn't want to frighten her. I stayed several days at the house, but it wasn't until the fourth day that the rocks started to hit the house again. The woman was angry and she started pacing around her house shouting all sorts of things, but I told her that she needed to keep it down so I could catch the perpetrator in the act. She did as much, but she didn't like it. I quietly made my way outside and my way out towards the back. Sure enough, rocks were flying past my head, so I had to keep ducking. Eventually, I found myself behind a big pile of firewood, and I just stayed behind that. Those rocks weren't stopping, so I had to start yelling at the person, but it didn't make much difference. Finally, I peeked my head around the side of the firewood, and I could see whoever it was hiding being the trees. It was a dark figure, and it smelled terrible, just like the child had said, and it looked as if it were watching me. The rocks finally stopped. I'm not sure if it was because they didn't have any more to throw, or if it was because it saw me looking at them. So I edged closer to the perpetrator, but it ran away fast. Before it did, I got a bit more of a look at it, and truth be told, that thing was covered in dark hair. Now I told you I don't do ghost stories or anything like that, but I can't quite explain what was throwing those rocks. You hear these stories growing up, and you think, that's not true, no way but I'm realizing the world isn't as black and white as I thought. Maybe there is some gray area in between. I can't believe I'm writing this, but I've got to get this down just so I don't think I'm crazy. My sister and I have always been close. When we moved out after college, we stayed in roughly the same area, so we made a point of visiting often until 2019 anyway, because she moved several hours north for a new job. I promised I would drive up to see her and her new place as soon as I could. But the pandemic hit and I had to delay my trip for about a year and a half. When I was finally able to go, I was so excited. I was looking forward to seeing my sister and getting some peace and quiet. Two days before I was supposed to go, Janet called me and she seemed, I don't know, a little off. She teased me about little things like remembering to pack my toothbrush and extra socks, but she sounded kind of nervous. Then she told me that it was very important that I get an early start, so I would get there before dark. I brushed it off because she's always made fun of me for being a late riser, but then she repeated it and said it was serious because the road to her house always gets dark super fast. She even made me promise that I would leave early to get there before sundown. I didn't see why it was such a big deal because I drive home from work at night all the time, but I figured she was just being a typical overprotective big sister, so I promise. We said goodbye and hung up. Fast forward to the day of the trip. I set my alarm early, but it didn't go off, so I overslept and had to start way later than I wanted. I felt bad because I'd promised, but it wasn't really my fault anyway, so oh well, right? At first, nothing out of the ordinary happened. But once I left the city and started on that long stretch of highway that cuts through the middle of nowhere, some weird stuff started happening. I'd look at the time and then I'd blink, and it would be like 30 minutes later, or my radio would cut out suddenly, or switch channels on its own. The longer I drove, the more frequent the weird stuff became. It started off slow but ramped up to something happening every couple of minutes, and then the sun set. Okay, I thought Janet was over-exaggerating when she told me about this, and you probably think I'm over-exaggerating now, but I swear it was practically instantaneous. One minute, it was sunshine, and the next I could barely see in front of me, even with the headlights on. It was like the night just slammed down on my car. 
I must have gotten confused at some point because I somehow found myself driving down a narrow side road away from the main highway that I was supposed to take. It cut right through the surrounding woods, and the trees were practically touching the sides of my car. I thought about trying to turn around, but I quickly realized it wasn't possible. I checked my GPS app and saw that if I just kept going for a couple more miles, there would be a spot where I could merge back onto the main road. As I drove, I started getting this really creepy feeling like I was being watched. I told myself that I was just tired and spooked from the long drive. I mean, I was in the middle of nowhere at night. Nobody was out here but me, right? I managed to calm myself down, but barely a minute passed before I heard the most terrifying sound ever. It was a high-pitched shriek, and I thought it was an animal, but somehow it sounded eerily human. It startled me so bad that I automatically pressed the gas a little harder. Everything happened so fast. First I felt the car dip, then there was a loud bang, then I jerked the steering wheel hard to the right to get away from the noise. But the car just sort of dragged. I took my foot off the gas. My heart was beating so fast I thought I'd die. It took me a second to calm down enough to realize that I'd probably just blown a tire. According to GPS, I was really close to the highway. I called Janet to let her know what had happened. She said she'd pick me up, but she sounded very worried. She said to walk the rest of the road to the highway and don't hang up. I was nervous about traveling alone and on foot, but it was a short walk and I was still on the phone with Janet, so I felt a little better. I had almost reached the edge of the trees when this awful stench hit my nose. It was definitely something rotten and decaying. I don't know what death smells like, but I'm sure this must be it. Then it happened. A blood-curdling shriek, just like before, but closer this time. Much, much closer. And it sounded like it was directly behind me. I turned around and I swear that for a second I saw a pair of glowing red dots like eyes, but they disappeared behind the trees. I freaked out and started sprinting for the highway. I don't know why, but somehow I was certain that something was pursuing me and that it was just letting me go because it wanted to. There were no more screams, but that horrible smell stayed. After that, it was a blur. I just remember vague flashes, reaching the highway, getting in Janet's car, walking in her front door. I don't think either of us said more than a couple words. The next morning, everything was weirdly normal. Janet was oddly chipper and gushed about being so glad to see me. My car was even parked in her driveway with all four tires intact. I tried to talk to her about what happened last night, but she just kept saying vague stuff about how it must have been a tiring drive and how she always had weird dreams after a long trip. Maybe it was just a weird dream. Janet and I had a great time catching up and swimming in the nearby lake. Everything was perfect until it was time for me to go home. I hadn't gone into my car since I got to Janet's place, and when I opened my car door, I got hit full in the face by a horrible stench, rot and decay. It was the same horrible smell as that night in the woods. If the smell is real, then what else about that night is real? I don't know if I want to find out. I went on a camping trip with my two best friends from college. It was the weekend after graduation, and we wanted to do one last thing together before heading off to opposite ends of the country. It was just going to be a simple, two-night stay at a local park. The park itself was highly trafficked and well-maintained. Its main attraction was a swimming beach. This wasn't some remote, backcountry wilderness area. It was a state park. A normal state park. Nothing bad was supposed to happen, so it didn't even enter our minds to be nervous. We got there on a Friday night. The campground was less than half a mile from the parking lot. They had carts at the lot we could use to carry our things to the site. We had camp set up in less than an hour. Everything was going perfect. All these stories I've heard of people running into bad things in the woods, they all start with someone feeling something is off and ignoring it. That wasn't the case with us. There were no warning signs. It was nearly dark that first night, and we all famished, but we decided to go for a quick swim at the beach first. Most of the daytime, beachgoers had cleared out by that time. By the time the sun set, we had the beach to ourselves. Nothing there felt odd or out of place. However, just as we were leaving, all three of us saw a white light across the lake. 
At first, it looked like the moon's reflection off the still waters of the lake. We all stopped what we were doing to watch this light, almost as if we were in some sort of trance. Clouds passed over the moon, hiding it from view, and yet, the light was still there, gleaming off the water. The longer I stared at it, the more I wanted to figure out its cause. I started walking toward the lake by my friend stopped me. She asked what I was doing, and I told her honestly, I don't know. I don't know why I did that. The longer I stared at the light, the more I was drawn towards it. That was the point I should have known something was wrong, but I didn't. I never felt that I was in the presence of something evil. My friend figured it must be some sort of optical illusion and said as much. We agreed and went back to the campsite. We made dinner over the campfire, and the situation with the light fell to the back of my mind. I still wondered what it was, but it wasn't as all-consuming as when I was watching it at the lake. We all had a really fun night at the campsite. It had rained overnight, but our tents held up. There was a bit of standing water around various parts of the campground. I didn't notice it until I went for a walk around that morning and stumbled upon a fairly substantial pool right in the middle of the path. The water almost looked black, and in the center of the pool was the light. The same light we saw in the lake the night before. I knew then that the light was beneath the water and not a reflection of something above. I ran back to the campsite to get my friends and show them the pool. The only problem was that when I brought them to the area, it was just a normal pool of water. It was clear, not black, and there was no light floating around inside. I shrugged off the strange experience and we went for our morning hike. Again, we had a perfectly normal day. We hiked nearly eight miles in total, had a nice picnic lunch, and made another great dinner over the campfire. We elected not to go to the beach that night. It was around 3 a.m. Sunday morning, the final day of the trip when I awoke to someone screaming in the woods. I jumped up and climbed out of my tent. It was my friend. She was having a nightmare. I should mention that this friend sometimes has night terrors and talks in her sleep. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. I was almost relieved when I realized it was her and not someone being harmed. We woke her up and kept her calm while she came to the realization she was having another night terror and that nothing was wrong. I made some coffee with the camp stove and we all sat up together in my tent. I asked her what her dream was about and she just looked at me with dead eyes and said, there's something in the water, don't follow it. I asked her to elaborate but she either couldn't or wouldn't. We tried going back to sleep but none of us were able to. I wanted to ask more about the thing in the water but I didn't want to further traumatize my friend. In all probability, it was just a bad dream. There was nothing to be afraid of. Despite all of us being tired that morning, we went for another hike and had another good day in the park. We had an early dinner and started to pack up our camp and haul everything to the car. We had underestimated the amount of time it would take to get everything loaded, and it was nearly dark that day before we were ready to leave. We had to drive past the lake on the way out of the park. When we passed by the lake, I got sick all of a sudden. Really sick. Like I had to pull over because I thought I was going to vomit. As soon as I stepped out of the car, I felt better. But then, I looked to the lake. There was that white light again. It was dancing beneath the surface of the lake. I couldn't take my eyes off it. It was like I was paralyzed. The light seemed to elongate like a snake and slithered from the far end of the lake towards the beach. When it got to land, it threw itself upon the earth. It looked like a pool of liquid at that point, like what moonlight would be if you could catch it in a bottle. The liquid stared moving, like it was going to change form or become something else. I felt a hand grab my arm and pull me back into the car. It was my friend. I told you don't follow it, she said, and we left. I never went back to that park, and I never figured out what the light was. I asked my friend who had the dream about it, and she would only tell me that it was evil. That was it.